Okay. I think folks are gonna be slowly joining us. Thank you all for joining us. This is our sixth confab and we're really fortunate today to have an expert to talk about moving in collections and all of that that it entails. Um, we have Dominic Alhambra from the Denver Museum of Nature. Um, and she's gonna get um, going here very shortly, but to, before we get going, um, I wanted to do a few things first. Um, and first of all, as we start all of our meetings here at History Colorado and in cooperation with our tribal partners, um, and since we are here, or since I am here at History Colorado or close to our uh, center in Denver, um, we have a land acknowledgement for um, our uh, tribal representative uh, partners um, who once inhabited this area. Uh, so in the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archaeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. With that, just a couple of announcements um, for the CONFAB. I hope that you are all enjoying the kind of new format for the CONFAB. I've tried to make it a little bit more of a presentation webinar based uh, meeting um, so that you can hear. And we have, have had some really great experts um, who've been partaking this year, um, as well as a little bit of time at the end to ask questions. So I hope that format has been working well for everybody. Um, if anybody would like to present or have a topic that they'd like to have discussed, um, let me know. Um, Dominic uh, happened to be um, um, really great to come forward and say, hey, I've got a presentation that I think that the CONFAB group might be interested in. And we really, really appreciate that very much that she's being able to share this um, with all of you. Um, so if you have any other ideas or suggestions, I'd be happy to host it in this forum. Um, just to kind of let you know some programming ideas that are coming forward. In July, we're going to have our own History Colorado's Kimberly Nowell, who's going to be presenting a little bit about their uh, artifact lending program. And we're going to talk a little bit about loaning artifacts in general, some of the best practices that are associated with that. So if you can join us for that, I don't have an exact uh, date set for that, but it'll be sometime in July. And then um, this is kind of unofficial because it's not been officially um, sanctioned yet, but we're gonna be trying to bring back a kind of virtual format of our old um, curation forum event in a virtual format. But this time we're trying to possibly put together a workshop that will have a grant writing workshop associated with it. We'll probably limit the number of folks that can participate in that program. And we'll be um, actually having folks, hopefully um, from the Northeast Document Center who will be providing the expertise on grant writing. Um, and we'll also talk a little bit about state historical fund grants, as well as do a virtual tour of the South Park Archaeological Repository where last in 2020, we were actually gonna have our, our in-person um, um, curation forum. So that would be uh, in lieu of that. So we're looking at maybe a September or October date for that. So um, I will keep you posted as um, that gets actually finalized and official. So, um, and uh, we're also kind of still looking to, you know, suggestions, how the program is going um, what kind of needs your repository or students or those that you're um, that we could help facilitate. So if you have suggestions or ideas, I welcome all of those or criticisms or constructive uh, ideas of any sort. Um, please just email me and let me know or give me a phone call. Be happy to try to facilitate that. So I thought before we begin, because this is also a confab where we like to not only have a presentation, but also just um, a, a place to kind of talk and meet, um, to just kind of have all of us sort of introduce ourselves. Um, so, you know me, um, 
Todd McMahon, uh, State Curation Coordinator, also Staff Archaeologist at History Colorado at the um, State Historic Preservation Office and Office of the State Archaeologist. And what I'd like to do is just have you come, if you can, if you'd like to turn your, your camera on, we'd love to see you. But if you can't, just uh, tell us who you are and what institution you are with. As I know that there's some new folks here that are joining us for the first time and not all of us know each other. So with that, and I'll let Dominic be the last. So she's, she's not up first. So we're gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna kind of go from where I'm seeing folks. And my first person that I see is uh, Karen Sear. If you could uh, introduce yourself and tell us um, where you're from and what you're with. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Karen. Um, I'm with 17 Mile House um, in Arapahoe County um, with open spaces. Um, and I'm the one person that uh, works with everything with visitor outreach, uh, volunteers, um, school groups, the collection. Um, so pretty much most anything there. Great, excellent. Um, and then next to her is uh, one of my colleagues who's actually uh, virtually from out of state at the moment, but will be joining us here in Colorado real soon, Glennis. Um, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Glenis Etchavari. Uh, as Todd said, I work with him at History Colorado. Um, I'm the new NAGPRA liaison and tribal conservation coordinator. And yes, I am calling in from Washington State, where I currently live, but I will be in Denver very soon. Looking forward to it. Great. Thank you, Glenis, and welcome. Um, Sarah is next that I see on my screen. Sarah Sachs. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Sachs. I'm the museums manager for City of Greeley Museums. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then I'm gonna go to the next row below her uh, as another one of my colleagues, uh, Katie Arnston. Katie, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hello everybody, my name is Katie Arnston. I'm with the History Colorado State Historical Fund. So grant funding opportunities for archaeology yeah. and for historic preservation, such as interpretive work in your museums or saving your historic places. Next time. Thank you. All right. And then below her, it looks like it's uh, Christy Kane from UC. Hi, everyone. I'm Christy. I'm the Anthropology Collections Manager at the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History. Thank you, Christy, for joining us. And then next to her is uh, Sarah. Uh, Sarah is one of my friends. Sarah, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Sarah. I've just been interning with Todd this semester um, on state approved repositories. Um, yeah, I'm just happy to be here and meet all and of you. You're with the, which university? I'm with um, University of Colorado, Denver, so. Yes, thank you. Okay, and then next I have, uh, I see Jim. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Jim Drew. I'm the volunteer coordinator and also a collection manager with Boulder County Parks and Open Space. And uh, we have a few historic sites around the county. Thanks for joining us, Drew. Jim, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, and then I've got another colleague, um, Rebecca, on that. Hi, I'm Becca Simon, assistant state archeologist. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Becca. And then below on the last line, I've got Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Nylas. I'm also at History Colorado. I am the associate registrar. Thank you, Amy. And below next to her, I've got Megan. Hi, uh, my name is Megan Trekkie. I am the registrar with the science division at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Excellent, thank you. And then next to her, Jill. I am Jill and I am the lab coordinator for the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Metropolitan State University of Denver. Um, so I oversee labs across all of the different subfields of anthropology. So we have ethnographic collections, archeological collections, et cetera. Nice to see you all. Great, thank you. And then Katie. Hi, I'm Katie Ross. I'm the curator of collections at the City of Greeley Museums. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, well, I thought I would um, introduce Dominique 
Um, we're really fortunate to have Dominic uh, again present to us today. Um, Dominic is the Anthropology Collections Manager and NAGPRA Coordinator at Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, she's worked over 10 years in collection stewardship and she's worked for such institutions as the National Park Service, University of Colorado Museum of Natural History, and the University of Iowa Museum of Art. So um, please, um, please welcome her. And um, Dominic, why don't you uh, go ahead and if you wanna load up your presentation, that would be great. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's so nice to meet everybody. Some new faces and familiar faces. So just gonna full screen it almost there. Cool. How's that looking? Great. Awesome. So um, th thank you so much to uh, Todd and um, to the whole uh, repository network for inviting me to do this presentation. So this is about our world ethnology collections move that we did last year from July to December of 2020. And um, yeah, this is pivoting in a pandemic. So this project was funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And this was through the first stimulus package that um, came out in um, early 2020. And it was formally called NEH CARES, the acronym being the Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security. And like I said, the project period was from July 1st to December 31st of 2020. So a quick background, uh, the, the grant itself actually was a really quick turnaround. Um, if some of you might recall, it was basically posted in April and then just a few weeks it was open and then it was due in, uh, on May 11th. So uh, DMNS itself was closed from March to June for 100 days. So um, we wrote this grant all offsite and um, we were allowed to return to the building. The collection staff were on a limited basis during the first week of June, which we really needed because um, once we were notified, we basically had to start right away. And a lot of it was trying to figure out where had we dropped everything in March and trying to wrap up all of those things and clear the workshop and figure out the stopping places for all those different projects so that we could focus on this one. So the NEH received 2,300 eligible applications that requested more than 370 million in funding, which was a lot. And in the end, they were able to fund 317 projects for about $40 million. So that works out to about 14% um, of applicants. And I know um, they distributed it um, among all the 50 states. So there were about five or so that got awarded in Colorado. So we're really uh, proud that we were able to be competitive for this grant and that we were able to um, pr pursue this project. So um, what we ended up writing into the grant, uh, thanks to the help of our grant officer, uh, Jill Viewig, was to move to rehouse and move about 3,200 objects in world ethnology storage. And this included uh, the collections from Africa, South America, and Central America. And the funds went primarily toward partially supporting salaries for 10 staff. So the PIs that wrote the grant were um, Melissa Beckhofer and um, Steve Nash, the directors of collections and anthropology, respectively but it went to supporting, like I said, 10 different staff. And when I say partially support, some folks were written in for just a few hours a week, 
like some of a lot of the people who were working off site or like the PIs who are doing just some data entry and high level project activities. And then other folks that were working on site, like the collections managers, our photographer and our conservator were written up to from half time up to almost full time. So we really did put in a ton of hours on, on this grant. And although we applied for um, $300,000 because the match was not required, that was the highest amount that they um, that was in the grant guidelines, uh, we received half of that amount, which was still awesome because we were really able to make the funding go a very, very long way. So here are uh, the before photos. Like I always tell folks, you know, when you're starting out with a big project, take the before shots, because at the end you'll be like, wait, we really did all that? Um, so, so here is our uh, world ethnology storage space. And a quick background on um, the anthro collections at DMNS. Uh, before we opened our collections facility in 2013, anthropology collections were in about uh, 12 different storage spaces and um, uh, collections at the museum in total were in like 54 different storage spaces, something like that. Um, but with anthropology collections, you know, we've been slowly going room by room and uh, bringing things downstairs. And so we're down to three when I, when I started uh, about three years ago. Um, with this move, it's now two, so that's really great. Um, but what you can see is that, you know, it's, by our standards, like, we think this is really bad, but I know that's not necessarily true, you know, like, every, every museum has, you know, different kinds of, based on the constraints, they have different issues with their storage areas. So I know this is not the worst in the world, but I can tell you what the issues that, the issues in this room that we did have. And some of that was certainly um, environmental control. Uh, this room really had a lot of temperature fluctuations. I think there was one time we went in there and it was like 82 degrees. And for some reason, like the heat was on full blast. And so we like ran to building ops and we're like, okay, you have to turn that off. But gradually, cause we don't want a crazy swing in the other direction as you bring it back down either, right? Um, so there were, you know, issues with uh, uh, temperature and heating control. Um, certainly it's a porous envelope. Um, this part of the building, there are um, like mice can get in. It's near a lot of offices. In the past, there have been critters uh, running around. Um, fortunately, not recently, but it's still a porous room. And uh, certainly the overcrowding that you see on the shelves, uh, lots of objects crammed together, which is, um, you know, it happens. And, um, and then certainly probably materials was the one that was doing the most active damage to the collections. Uh, it's really interesting because for the anthropology department, this was kind of the like the last frontier of the collections. We were always planning to move it last after um, we moved everything else from the North American ethnology collections, which is what we're like really, really well known for. But we do have this like small world ethnology collections from um, those three different regions. And, um, but it hasn't been heavily studied. We didn't really know a whole lot about what was in it. Um, to show you, to give you an example of like how long it's been since anybody's looked at this stuff, some of this stuff, uh, there was, I believe, a pest infestation in the mid 90s. And they went, they went through and they wrapped or, and bagged everything in this room and it went through a freezing cycle. And then flash forward to 2020 and a lot of these collections, I would say like 75% of the stuff in this room 
was still in the plastic bags from the 1994 infestation. So if we had to go through and like unwrap those, and like the plat, you, you know how plastics fall apart. Like some of those bags were really crunchy. Um, so certainly the plastic materials and um, you know things are in like our uh, acidic boxes, cardboard boxes, cardboard trays, and um, and then of course like the wood shelving that they put in, um, you know that uh, stuff off gases. And then you also see that there. Uh, some of the shelves are covered in plastic. And that was because a couple of years ago, building ops had to get into the ceiling to do some duct work. So we had to cover like half the room um, for the safety of the collection. All right, so what we had to do was adapt our rehousing process and um, uh, our, our full rehousing process is available in a how-to video online that we can send out after uh, this presentation. But um, if, you, if, if you don't know, uh, what we have in our system in the before times was we had 40 to 50 volunteers coming in uh, during the course of a week to help us build these mounts, right? And these mounts, they're you know, custom measured to every object. They get a full foam um, cavity mount, you know, carved to the shape of the object and then lined with Tyvek. And then it gets a paper label hand applied um, with a Lesco adhesive, which is the, 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 the label adhesives are the only adhesives used in this mount. Um, everything else is held together with uh, friction and gravity. Um, you see the, the nylon rivets there. And then of course there's that, um, there's a, a blue board pallet underneath the foam to support it. But we couldn't go full out for that. Um, with the pandemic there, uh, because of limitations based on our variants for you know, admissions to the public, as well as uh, capacity limits for the different areas of the museum, specifically, you know, the workshop and that storage space based on its square footage and social distancing requirements, uh, we could really only have very, very limited staff um, on site. And when I say they were on site, like we weren't even allowed to be on site at the same time. It was, we were, you know, alternating days a lot and just kind of this staggered system. So based on that, uh, we knew we had to scale back the mounts. And with that, you know, we, we wanted to keep the custom, the custom box, uh, but with the, with the mount itself, you know, we decided let's just line the bottom of the box with, the, with a piece of ethafoam. And then, you know, if the, if the object's a little bit wobbly, um, oh, there's stuff in the chat, my bad. Um, <laughs> Oh, cool. Uh, if there's, if the objects are a little bit wobbly, we would, uh, you know, put wedges in there just to stabilize it so it wouldn't, you know, fall over. So there's that. Cool. So what ended up uh, happening is that we fell in like organically, which was really great into this five day rehousing cycle. And really, I, I like to say, I'm like, we had to go into beast mode. I mean, 3,200 objects, you know, you divide it by six months and you math it out. You know, we had to average, I mean, we, we wanted to get as much done as we could, even with like half the funding. That's just what we wanted to do. So we went into beast mode. And um, this is one of the <laughs> pieces that I really like. It is a club from the San people of Africa. And as you can see, it's a, a wooden shaft studded with a ton of nails. And it's like from The Walking Dead or something, but it's, it's really gnarly looking and I would not want to meet that in a fight, but I thought it, it's just really cool. So this is in a handout that, um, that Todd has or will be providing. And this basically show, uh, just um, displays the 
like the, the, the cycle that we went through every five days. And what I tell people when, when they see this is that you do not have to say, hey, we're gonna do 3,200 objects, which is 150 objects a week with like three people. You know, you can scale this to fit whatever your rehousing project is, right? So if you have a collection, you know, um, if you have a collection, figure out how many objects you have and then how many staff, volunteers, interns, and other staff, figure out how many, how many people are available to work on it and then scale it back from there. You know, how many days is it going to take you to do X, right? And what I think, you know, laying out this cycle for us really helped, how it really helped is that it provides the consistency that you need to complete the project. So when you see the handout that um, we sent out, that's just breaking it down how we did it for our project, but you can just take that, you can move steps around, you can take out certain steps. I mean, you don't have to build a custom out for every object, but you know, create your workflow, right? Like the step-by-step -step process of how you're plan how you rehouse in the institution that you work at, right? And then take the number of objects you have in your collection and then work backwards from there and create your own cycle. Maybe it's not five days, maybe it's eight days, maybe it's two weeks. That's fine. But like I said, consistency is what is really key uh, for this project, you know. And obviously, as you're conducting any rehousing project, you know, other stuff comes up. And the other thing that um, you'll see in the later part of this, this presentation is that you know, the number of objects can flux based on everything else you're dealing with, right? I mean, we still had incoming collections. I still had research requests that I had to go into the paper files and do. Uh, there were webinars and other things we had to attend. Um, so it's all about creating a consistent but flexible system. Oh, okay. All right, there we go. So uh, the, the, at the beginning of the cycle, um, basically uh, I'd be in that room with a cart and a measuring tape and my laptop, and I would measure a new group of objects. It was about 100 to 150 on average. Again, you don't have to do that many. I'm just an overachiever. Um, but basically you pull the objects off of the shelves and then you unwrap those, oh gosh, I clicked. Uh, I had to unwrap them from their, whatever situation they were wrapped in sometimes. And then I'm emptying them shelf by shelf, right? And then I take those measurements that I'm taking and they go into the Excel spreadsheet with the formula that's going to auto calculate the size of the box. And then when that's done, I place that onto the holding rack for, uh, basically a photography and then physically bringing them downstairs. So the next thing that happens is once I'm out of there, um, Jeff goes up there, uh, our assistant collections manager, Jeff Fegley, and he takes reference photos of the objects. And again, it, they're on the racks and then he brings them downstairs. Uh, meanwhile, I create a group of those objects in the database and then I assign you know, one of the three regions, right? It gets coded as being from Africa, Central America, or South America. And then of course, as I was measuring things, um, I didn't do full on condition like reports, but if something was clearly broken or damaged, I would put that in, I would type that information into the Excel spreadsheet, and then I would take that and also type it into the database. All right, so the, uh, the racks of objects are now downstairs after um, photography is completed. And uh, then you take that list, shove it into the database, and then update the, the location as to now being in the workshop. And then Jeff takes those dimensions 
and uh, starts cutting and um, uh, coding the boards. So when I say code the boards, basically it says like, this is the catalog number, this is the rack it's located on, and this is the region it's in. And I have to say like, um, uh, and then of course, as he cuts the boards, I start assembling boxes. And again, this is what you wanna look at with your workflow. You know, we have a wall cutter and Jeff is extremely fast at cutting boards. You know, he has a ton of experience at it. If I had to cut the boards, like this process would take two weeks. Cause when I cut a board, I'm like, all right, I'm lining up to the ruler. Is it level? All right, is it really level? Is, is it lined up to the right thing? Okay, now I'll cut. But he can just crack them out. Um, uh, so again, you know, figure out your workflow based on the skill level of you and your staff. You don't have to, you know, do something that feels unattainable. Like work on it a way in a way that is feasible for you. So we had lots of folks helping with box assembly. I'm assembling boxes. Our uh, conservator Catherine is assembling boxes. And um, the goal is typically, you know, either have it done by the end of the day on Friday or early Monday, if possible. Um, Fridays, uh, Jeff is, that was his work from home day. So all the photos that he took, he's editing and processing all of those photos. And then of course, we were fortunate that in the summer, we were able to have a limited number of teen science scholars in the building that was you know, included. So they helped us assemble a lot of the boxes. So it was really great to have their help. Right, and then marrying the objects, right? Uh, Jeff wraps up the box building and then he cuts the pallets and the liners and uh, matches the objects with their boxes and puts the barcode on. And then basically they're loaded onto the racks. When I say they're loaded onto the racks by region, right? Sometimes it's like, all right, these two shelves on the rack are Central America. And then these four are uh, Africa. And then like this other rack is all South America. It's dependent on the group and what was coming through. And then Monday was my work from home day. And I worked with curators on data cleanup. And of course, then also uploaded the photos into EMU. I tended to do them in big batches about once a month. All right, and then putting our objects into storage. I like to tease that uh, the some of the other departments are really jealous because the curators would never do this. But uh, Dr. Michelle Coons and Dr. Erin Baxter were extremely awesome. And they came in, Wednesdays were their one uh, on-site day. And that was specifically to come in to help put objects away. Uh, so that basically means, you know, loading the drawers into the cabinets, then putting the objects on the, uh, in the drawers. Um, Michelle really loved like Tetrising of the boxes, which was delightful to watch. And then, and then basically with our barcoder, which again helps with, you know, some of this like efficiency and doing things quickly, you basically scan the drawer and then you scan all the objects on the, on the, in the drawer, and then you hit send and it automatically updates everything for you. And then um, basically at the, at the end of Wednesdays, I just do like, like a quick audit of the group, right? Because I created it and just quickly check that, you know, everything got put into a shelf and they were awesome. Like really it was maybe just like one or two every week that just missed a scan. And I was able to go back there and update those really, really quickly. And the other thing that was great was because they were putting away objects, you know, as you saw, like the cycle started on Tuesdays, like we're already hitting the next group. All right, I'll just take a quick drink of water. So basically we repeated that 22 more times and uh, we rehoused over 2,600 objects. We took over 5,200 
reference photos usually take a couple per object over the course of 29 weeks. And that was incredible because even though we got half the funding, we were able to rehouse over 82% of the 3,200 that we wrote into the grant, right? And we could have said to NEH, well, you gave us half the money, we're gonna rehouse half the things. But, um, you know, like at least, you know, when Jeff and I like sat down and we're planning this project, we both agreed, we're like, let's, let, let's go for it and see how much we can do. And he's really great at like estimating how long or, you know, based on the number of people and like how long something's taking that he, it'll be like, it'll take this long or we'll get this much done. Cause he was like, I think it's gonna be 75 to 80%. And uh, he was right on the money. And then of course we definitely wanted to finish the other 20-ish percent uh, that was remaining in the room. So we hit that, we just kept going uh, into 2021. And what ended up being the final totals for the whole project was we moved and rehoused over 3,300 objects. And that was um, 31 uh, groups, right? 31 cycles. And uh, we did use a lot of materials. Materials were not written into the grant. When they gave us half the money, we're like, okay, we're gonna use what we have and we will order from our own supply line and really just save the funds for the staff salary uh, side of things. Uh, but it does use a lot of board. And we ended up finishing um, right on target um, end of March of this year. All right, so like I said, we wrote uh, 10 different staff into the project and you might be wondering what everyone else was doing. So our conservator, uh, Catherine Roish, uh, as I said before, I flagged the objects that were damaged or broken and um, entered that into EMU. And then Catherine could look them up in EMU and request uh, batches of objects to be sent to her lab. Right, so while we're doing, you know, that five day cycle, you know, in between all of those steps, we're bringing objects from the, uh, from the preservation space to the lab and um, ro rotating objects uh, back and forth. And, you know, depending on what was up with it, with, with a particular thing and, you know, the kind of assessment it needed or any basic repairs that she could do. It does take a while, but you know, she finished um, 30 reports and assessments. Our photographer extraordinaire, uh, Rick Wicker, uh, he was written for quite a bit of time, I think almost half time. And so he was uh, doing photography for uh, items that curators had identified as, you know, significant or aesthetic or important in some way. And, you know, while me and Jeff, we just took like the documentary photos, these are the formal studio photos that are like publication quality. And it's a testament to his skill that, you know, he really gives objects like personality and like brings them to life. And it went on the cover of our uh, museum magazine, as well as many different social media posts and uh, articles that curators wrote. And we did a similar process to what we were doing with uh, Catherine, where, um, well, actually the, curator, the curators would send us, all right, here's the list of objects we think are significant and we would like Rick to photograph. And then Rick would tell us based on his schedule, like, all right, I can take shots of 20 medium-sized things this week. And we would go to the list, pull them, and um, rotate them through his lab. And he ended up, yeah, uh, photographing over 311. He took 311 uh, total images. I think it was like over 275 objects. Awesome. And then, of course, uh, data cleanup. 
Uh, and um, uh, uh, Courtney Shesky is one of our uh, business support specialists, but she also has a master's degree in African studies. So uh, our curators are all Southwestern archeologists by training. So Courtney really um, stepped up and uh, used her expertise to help us uh, with our, um, the, the, the cleanup for our African collection, which was really awesome. And the, that's another thing I really loved about this project is that, you know, everybody's bringing their expertise to the table and, you know, in, in ways that, you know, weren't necessarily part of their regular job, right? Like the curators putting away objects, Courtney cataloging the African collection. It was awesome. So, uh, uh, Emu calls it the thesaurus. You know, you can call it the lexicon or um, nomenclature, but uh, basically Michelle cleaned up the Central and South American culture groups and Courtney cleaned up the um, African culture groups and uh, restructuring included the, uh, very, it included several things. Um, one of it was, um, one of the things was we had a lot of terms in there that weren't actually being used. Like we didn't have anything in our collection from this culture group, but this culture group is in the database. And we're like, it, it, it was super cluttered. Africa started out with over 500 terms. And we decided, hey, let's pare that down to just the, just the ones represented in our collection. So that came down to about 120 terms. For Central and South America, I think we started with over 300, and that came down to also about um, uh, 120. And uh, the other thing was the the trees, the trees were also very flat, right? So you'd, you'd start with like continent and then subregion and then the different groups within that region. But since it wasn't really, it hadn't been cleaned up in the way we do for our North American or uh, our, our North American collections because we just hadn't gotten to that part yet, right? Uh, but for this, it was just like, all right, let's clean up. Let's actually give it a structure. So they did that. And then of course, you know, fixing the different terms, right? Like some terms were just like really outdated. Some of them were racist. And, you know, some we added ones were like, hey, uh, this is what these people call themselves. Let's use that, and, and in addition to what it's what, what is commonly known in, you know, what is commonly known by like the Western scientific view or you know anthropologists. Like we know that people will use that search term when they're using a database, but we also want to add like the voices of. Uh, those um, indigenous peoples, like when we know uh, what they call themselves, right? And as, as some of this uh, could be done in big batch updates. Some of them had to be updated, you know, individually, like each record one by one. And uh, and then of course, you know, our uh, uh, archivist and a database person, uh, a Sam Schiller, he's providing database support. Uh, by like, you know, if the, the barcoding can get buggy sometimes, so he, he helped out with that. And then certainly exporting data and like creating reports for the curators. Uh, uh, Michelle is great at EMU. Uh, the others, not so much, but they're, you know, you just work with like the skills and the expertise people have, right? Like I wasn't gonna get people to learn EMU in six months, in the six months of the project. So sometimes putting together a crystal report and getting the data to them through, a, through that was the fastest way to do it. And that was totally fine. You know, we had six months to do it. And then of course, uh, finally um, updating and publishing the culture groups online, which is still ongoing, but it's getting better. I think it's, it might be up there. It, it, it should be up there this summer, hopefully. Yeah, and then uh, finally, uh, collections research. So uh, again, this was identifying what are the significant items in our collection and adding that descriptive information to our catalog records. 
uh, Steve wrote a Sapiens article. Um, Sapiens is this um, anthropology online news magazine. You know, Dr. Chip Colwell is the editor in chief, and Steve has a column on there. And he actually he wrote about these uh, uh, these statues. They're called Ere Ibeji, and they're from the Yoruba peoples of Nigeria. And uh, um, um, basically, the Yoruba have a high rate of multiple births, but also a lot of them can die in infancy or very, very young. And what the parents end up doing is, you know, they work with a carver to uh, carve these ibeji, which represent the adult versions of their their children, but also it is a manifestation of their child's soul, and and they feed these uh, they they feed these these statues by you know putting the the red mud on them and um, carrying them around, and uh, but also they got really popular with in in the Western art market with collectors. Uh, and uh, so artists started making um, uh, Ibeji for the art market. Uh, and um, so these, because like they're really, really fancy and they're not that worn, were probably made for the art market. And um, Steve himself is a twin. And so he wrote this whole article about the Yoruba peoples and, you know, what does it mean to be a twin for him? So that was really cool. And then as we ended up writing the final report, we aggregated all of the data across all of the museum's social media platforms. And we found that we had over 150,000 total social media engagements. And that like specific with the specific content generated by um, the, the research and work that we did on this grant. So that's huge. And then uh, website updates. Uh, again, because we didn't know a whole lot about the collection, the, the, the African and the, the world ethnology section of our website was just kind of like uh, not as um, robust as some of the other uh, sections. And we really, really updated that. Um, and then uh, flat art. So that room still has, this wasn't included in the grant, but since we were working in that room, uh, we did do like a basic assessment of like, all right, what flat art is sitting in those flat files in the corner? It's still there, but that's okay. And you know, what are the significant um, artists and items in there? And then finally, we have um, Sansa's uh, shrunken heads from South America, and uh, we have six. And uh, Dr. Erin Baxter, uh, she is working on you know reanalyzing them because several people have done research projects on our shrunken heads, and some of them are real and some of them are fake. And it's interesting because like historically, it said these are real and these are fake, and then. They did an, an analysis on the hair. And based on that, it's like, well, actually these are real and these are fake. And then um, Aaron just looked into how do you authenticate shrunken heads? And it was it's different because you can have a fake head but put real human hair in it. And, and then of course you can have a whole, a, a completely real head. And we really, I don't know if you recently saw um, there, uh, something making the news rounds. There was a museum that repatriated an authentic shrunken head um, uh, to South America. The specific country is escaping me right now, maybe Ecuador. But um, uh, yes, they, they authenticated theirs through a CT scan. But Aaron is trying to figure out like, let's authenticate ours and work with museums in other parts of the country and maybe do potentially do a a big a, a bigger multi uh multi-institution uh repatriation so that's our big dream um you know we we really do want to continue uh progress on international repatriation
Okay, so uh, before and after photos, uh, this is always really fun. Um, as I like to say, you know, those commercials that say, you know, make the stuff disappear. And <laughs> we're, not, we're, we're not making it disappear. It just went downstairs, but it's still a really dramatic before and after. So you can see this is packed and there it goes. And there, and there it goes. Uh, th th those pots have come downstairs too. Um, these Guatemalan masks, that was a really, really busy shelf um, that took a couple weeks, but uh, there they go. So it's just like really satisfying. Um, this was our workspace and th th there wasn't a lot of like moving room. So we did end up taking down some of the shelving units to uh, make space just to give ourselves like more room to like move around and set objects out and photograph them and load them onto carts and racks. So. Uh, so that was really great. Um, cool, cool. Oh, interesting. The shrunken heads. Yes, morphometrics. Materials can be pretty obvious. And um, yes, other people with uh, shrunken heads, um, l let me know. Contact me. Um, we'll get something worked out with Aaron. But, you know, it's it's like a really big, like, ideal project and you know it'll take a while but um yeah it's super interesting so cool all right one more i like these okay <laughs> all right so where did they go uh if you haven't been to our uh, facility uh that's the avenue collection center um on the uh, south side of the building in two sub basements we're in the first sub basement and it opened in 2013 so there's our workshop area and our preservation space. And here's um, our Africa section and uh, the objects in the, in the, in the boxes. So um, yeah, they're just a lot happier in these lovely gasketed cabinets and archival materials. So takeaways and lessons. Uh, so uh, here, here, here's a shot of our workshop behind those doors that you just saw. And this was, uh, that was a giant musical instrument week where it's just like, all right, let's just hit oversized this week. And <laughs> so you can see like various statues and drums and the xylophone and other materials. Uh, and so this was a really unique opportunity for our humanities staff to unite and focus on a single project. And because uh, like we all just like threw down on this thing. And um, even sometimes it's just like, oh my God, I need more hours. What else can I work on? I need more hours. <laughs> that happens sometimes. But I mean, that just shows you how dedicated everyone was. And we really developed the process organically. Like it just kind of happened. We're like, all right, let's just, re let's just rehouse this and see how long it takes us. And that just became like, all right, this is every five days. And and it was also about working with people's strengths. Like, I mean, like I said earlier, you know, sometimes, you know, folks aren't adept at the database and you're not gonna train them in six months on the database. So here, let's get into Excel. I'll figure out a way to import it later. And, you know, working with people's expertise and backgrounds, like having a degree in African studies, we're like, yes, we need your help. We need your expertise. And, um, yeah, and their strengths and interests. And it's all about being adaptable and flexible. As I said, we're doing this project in the course of like the rest of our jobs. So um, while we were given like the space to be like, hey, they're busy on this grant, so you can say no to these other projects. As things come up, you know, we're still like helping out. And, um, and finally, I'm not gonna lie, you know, it was very fast paced and required a lot of grit and grind. You know, those Fridays, I am building boxes for uh, all, like a whole eight hour day, right? I'm like plugging into my podcasts, into my audiobooks. And um, I haven't done like full, um, like full days rehousing in about 10 years. And so I'm like, oh yeah, this is how it's like, like, I've, you know, redeveloped calluses on my fingers and all that fun stuff. But um, again, it's just a testament to like the dedication of um, the whole team.
And then finally, yeah, future directions. Uh, certainly as we were rehousing uh, collections and you know, as curators were moving them into the cabinets, they're like, oh, this is, I don't know why we have this in our, why we need this in our collection, right? Um, or this is not, you know, like research quality or museum quality, right? Like in the past, other folks may have said yes to things that now we're like, why do we have this? We're like paying rent on this thing. And it, no. <laughs> and so stuff like that. Um, and, uh, you know, that may not be in like the purview of our, you know, our, our research. And then um, certainly reconciling found and collection objects. I think, you know, through the course of moving it, I identified about 50 things that this has no number. And some of them I was able to figure out and some of them I haven't. So we have to figure out what to do with those. Uh, and then the room still contains the flat art. Uh, mostly the reason we couldn't bring it down is that our art rack's not built yet. <laughs> um, but also there's also a small collection. Not, 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 it's not small, it's a lot of beads. There's a lot of beads in, in two cabinets because at, at one point in the past, there was like a beadwork study collection that, um, uh, folks in the past put together and we have to reconcile that. And then as you saw, um, they still need their phone, the objects still need their phone mounts. And then of course, there's still the culture group reorganization that needs to happen, which is, you know, everything in our collection is organized uh, by culture group. So, you know, you put all the Yoruba things together and put all the um, San things together and, and such. So the, the reorg still needs to happen. And then certainly like potential for collaboration with um, communities in the, in the Denver area or other communities to help us learn more about some of these objects. Some of them were just like, I still don't know what this is, <laughs> but it says it's from this continent. So we're just gonna, we're gonna put it over there. Um, and then, and then finally, you might be wondering, okay, so uh, that room's empty and what are you, what will become of the room? And probably long-term it's gonna turn into some sort of office space. But uh, earlier in 2021, we did put in for a couple uh, more grants to process two of our, our two really big archeological collections, uh, Jones Miller from Eastern Colorado, that big bison site, uh, bison kill site. And then also WS Ranch, which is a uh, a Pueblo excavated in the 1970s in a massive field school uh, in West Central New Mexico. And we're hoping to uh, hold on to that room for a little while longer to uh, process uh, some of those archeological collections. Uh, you might be wondering why this picture is here. This is um, from our Aztec exhibit in 1994 and uh, it, I, it was awesome. Like the, the the exhibit the exhibit was massive, and you know they build these they built these custom dioramas, and you know they, they were very diligent about like the items they put in these dioramas. They got them all from like Mexico City, and you know they were collected in 1994. So it was uh, it was um, yeah, the, it was a great exhibit. And then they accessioned like a hundred props from this exhibit into the collection. And so I'm paying rent on like, paying rent, you know what I mean? I collect, I am caring for in perpetuity, like 20, 20, uh, or, oh God, there's a lot, uh, a bunch of baskets from this exhibit. And we're like, is that appropriate? Let's, let, let's figure that out. So, um, yeah. Um, that's fantastic. We're, we're at two o'clock. I know some folks are having to jump off. Um, yep, that's it actually. Thank you so much. That was an awesome <laughs> presentation. Um, I really, really appreciate it. I really enjoyed seeing everything DMS does. You guys are so, so of course uh, fortunate to have the fantastic facility that you have. But you also have some really fantastic people there that work there, and uh, really dedicated folks. And um, really appreciate all of the partnerships that you have um, fostered with all of us. And uh, uh, if, you know, this is really kind of is a great segue or it's kind of like a, a virtual way to, to visit you and, and visit your your work so 
thank you very much again for, for presenting. We can hang on for a few minutes because I'm sure there might be a few more questions. So I'm going to turn off my mic and if somebody else would like to turn on theirs and ask Dominique some questions, um, like I said, I'll, we can be on for a few more minutes. So please do. And I just want to thank all my fellow staff again. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you for this for letting me give this presentation. I'm glad you all. <laughs> Any questions? Um, I'm just kind of wondering like what your um, like general like journey was to DMNS and like where you were before and what your um, experience was like before DMNS. Yeah, totally. Um, so I've been in the museum field for about 12 years. Uh, I really, I started out um, in undergrad. I was volunteering in um, uh, archaeology labs with my professors. And that um, after I graduated, I did an internship, an internship at the Field Museum. I worked in some uh, local historical societies. I, I'm from the Chicago suburbs. And then, yeah, I worked as like, I, I worked in CRM and like these contract jobs for about five years. And then I went to grad school uh, for my uh, master's in anthropology uh, at the University of Iowa. And then when I graduated from there, um, I did, you know, some more contracts like with the park service. I worked at CU Boulder uh, for um, a, a Christy Kane in their collections. And um, I worked in an art museum uh, back in Iowa, and then I came here. And what I like to tell folks is I, um, it's, I mean, it, it, it is hard to, you know, to be like, okay, I have this contract and then I have to figure out like, okay, I have this contract and, you know, just jumping and moving around a lot. But what I really did try to do was like figure out, okay, what skill am I going to learn in this job that, you know, I didn't have before. So it's all about like learning, um, like learning new skills um, at each job. Like, is this like this database is new to me or I haven't worked with art before. Um, and so, yeah, it's about, I think like building, building your skill level and, and really like as you build those skills, like, like employers will be like, oh, well, they can do all that. You know, that's great. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Anyone else? Don't be shy. I'm trying to see if there was anything, any questions. Of course, uh, Christy said she has two sunken heads. We saw that earlier. Um, be curious to know if there's anybody else that has shrunken heads. I'm not sure that we do, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, like it's still like in the very, very early stages, but I think like Aaron's developed some contacts like with the, um, either a lab or possibly the DPD to like try to do some like access with like analytical instruments. So, um, so that's pretty cool. And then she mentioned, you know, like with the bigger goal of collaborating with other institutions that have a bunch of shrunken heads to try to do a group repatriation, which sounds awesome. Yeah, for sure. Do you, I had a question for you, do you know, can you roughly estimate how much your supplies were for the project or just can you give us a ballpark idea? Uh, in terms of supplies, a lot of it we already had on hand, but um, if you're looking at, all right, we, we, use, we use about 350 uh, sheets of blue board, uh, the, the heritage board from Talus. And I think that comes out to 20, 20 to 25 dollars a sheet um and they had had some supply issues so we were able to get like an extra discount um but that's just like raw numbers and then in terms of the uh the, the barcode rolls that's uh you know like it, uh 
like the printer's $500 and then like the ribbon plus like, like a dozen ribbons plus a dozen rolls of paper, the labels is about $500. And then the rivets, um, if, if you do the math, which I, I can't do with the math, but it's like, um, it's about like 11 cents a pair and then eight to 11 cents a pair, depending on your supplier and what volume you order at. Uh, but you know, if it's like, if we have like, if, if we built 3,200 boxes times like, you know, four per corner, that's 16 times 32 times 11 cents. So that number. <laughs> and, uh, Otherwise, I, I mean, that was really it. We, um, a, a lot of the ethafoam, it was like the scrap ethafoam that was already being used on the shelving because we're not planning to keep it in there long term. Um, eventually we'll foam them all out. But, you know, if it's, if it's been in contact with the objects for 20 years, like another few years, we we'll kill it. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we, we recycled the ethafoam sheeting that we already did have. Yeah, great. Just because we're kind of figuring what, what those costs were, but thank you. Anybody else? Jill. Um, I just had a thought going back to the shrunken heads for a minute. So you mentioned that um, the, the one that was recently repatriated from another institution, they determined its authenticity based on CT scanning. So I don't know if that's something that is like in the analytical methods that that you guys are considering if you are thinking about trying to you know apply for grant funding to CT scan or something but I know DMNS has worked before with CT scanning things like there's that whole thing in the the mummy the Egyptology exhibit about CT scanning a mummy and stuff so anyway I it seems like if you could get the money of course that's always the issue <laughs> that maybe right. you can do something like that with Anschutz and there are some anthropologists in the anatomy department at Anschutz um, that would probably think that's pretty cool. So just, yeah, to yeah, that would be an awesome thing to add. I think like what Erin is, my understanding is that like, she's looking at like DNA testing. Um, but, uh, but yes, the, 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 yeah, the one that recently happened, I think they did it through a CT scan. Like there's yes, yes. Yep. It, it, it's in that New York times article. I just threw in the chat. Um, but yes, that's the, you know, since we have done that in the past, I think that's definitely something we could potentially do. Like they found all sorts of weird ones with that one from Georgia. They're like, hey, it's stuff full of newspapers, <laughs> like through the scan. Um, so it's a really interesting story. So for sure, I think that's definitely a potential future thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? I had one more question for you, Dominic. So you took a lot of photos of all the objects, um, to, and I don't am not, you know, really familiar with the EMU system. But um, does all stuff get uploaded into the into the records onto the EMU system, or does it just a standalone place where you have them archived, or any of the any of the photos from the art from the objects? Yeah, the photos from the objects. So EMU. Um, so, so when I upload a batch of photos, like I, I keep the, I keep the files, but Emu itself, it creates its own file, its, its own copy that goes and lives in the Emu directories. Um, so it's its own thing once it's uploaded. Uh, but I, but I, I keep them for redundancy uh, too. So, you know, you never know. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I thought so. Argus does the same thing, so yeah. Right. And like, like maybe one day, like we've had problems with like running out of server space, but they figure out a way to make it bigger. So, I mean, because that's just the nature, the nature of like museum data, right? It's just going to keep growing. So yeah, we have to make more space. <laughs> yep. Any other questions? Cool. Um, Dominic, do you have your email? Maybe if folks have any questions, they can contact you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, please, please, please let me know um, if, yeah, if you have any follow-up questions, as uh, Todd said, uh, 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 or yeah, there'll be that 
the handout and I can also put together the slide deck uh, for you all. So yeah, thank you. This is great. Great. Well, thank you again, Dominic. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate all of you for joining us. I hope you've learned a little bit about how DMNS dealt with this really massive move and they really get a really good system down and the folks really know what they're doing. So um, we really appreciate uh, Dominic sharing that and um, we will join us again, hopefully in July for learning about learning. So again, Thank you all and we'll we'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Have a great afternoon. Yeah. Bye-bye.